Hello and welcome back to another Unfiltered Gamer board game review. Today's game up on the tabletop is Expeditions 1920 by Stonemeyer Games. It's the sequel to Scythe. It plays one to five players, takes roughly about 90 minutes or so to play and is for ages 14 and up. And in the game, a giant meteorite crashes in the Tuskegee River in Siberia. And a scientist goes out to see what has happened and what artifacts may have popped up. And a bunch of adventurers from the war have come and like secretly set up their own expeditions to find unique artifacts. You're going to be playing, playing as one of these adventurers and their animal companion. And you're going to be venturing off into the area to uh, discover new locations and gather artifacts. This game plays very similar to Scythe in the way in which you're going to be achieving objectives and uh, taking actions, utilizing like a token and moving to uh, kind of control what actions you can take, but it's also very different. It's a card-driven action management type game. The first thing you'll do is you'll get to take a move, play, and gather action, and then every other, t every other turn after that, you'll be moving your token onto one of the actions that I just mentioned and taking the other two actions. And you're basically going to be gathering as many cards as you can and kind of organizing them on your field and moving them in certain areas. You'll be taking meteorites and gathering those guys and melding them, or you'll be uh, learning about new items and equipping them eventually, and of course, completing quests. The game is going to be over when four missions of these specific types in the bottom of the game board are completed by one player, in which case everybody will get an extra turn. After that, you'll check to see how well you did, how much currency you managed to get, the quests you've completed, how many achievements you managed to make, your melds and of course the corruption you may have gotten along the way while discovering our ancient artifacts near meteorites which you know can cause that kind of stuff. Anyway that's the basic idea of the game. Let's get into how to set the game up, the basics of how to play, and then of course my review. While Expeditions might be the sequel to Scythe, this game is actually a little more simple to set up and it's kind of a lighter note than the previous game I mentioned. Now in this game you're going to be basically setting up base camp which is going to be the very bottom main game board. You'll place that down, you'll select this little 20 token and you can place it somewhere within that area. Then you're going to set up the game board. There's going to be the uh, south, the central, and northern quadrants. And you're going to go ahead and place uh, six uh, quadrants on the bottom. Then you're going to place seven in the middle here, and then you will place seven more on the top. And they're color coded to determine where, where and how you place them. Uh, if it is the first quadrant, they're going to be face up, the second will be face down, and the third will be face down. After that, you will take the main deck. You'll shuffle these purple cards here, and then you're going to place five of them face up in the little areas represented on the game board, the little open uh, hexagram areas that are not covered up by locations. Additionally, you're gonna be taking these map tokens, and you'll be placing them down on each of the central areas of the center and the uh, northern boards here. Additionally, there's going to be units that you're going to have throughout the game. Um, there are five different colored units. There are purple, there are yellow, blue, red, and green. Simply take those out and put them within reach of all players. I suggest taking five of each and setting them on each side so that all players can reach them. You'll have extra map tokens, which you'll set aside, as well as currency tokens that you can arrange in this little bin that comes with the game. Then. After that, you'll determine the number of players playing the game. Each player is going to get their own mech, as well as their own base standee for the color of their character, and a player board. With your player board, you're gonna also take your character and your companion that represent your mech, two player aid cards, four of your objective markers, just like in the original Scythe and other Stonemeyer games, as well as one action cube, which you'll place on the refresh location. Finally, you'll be taking your power and your guile tokens, your green and orange, and placing them on the zero on your tracker. And then the rest of the stuff that you'll have is just these little corruption tokens. You'll take these little tokens here and you'll place them in this bag, which you will use at a later date. Once you've done that, everything else is ready to go, and you can go ahead and start the game expeditions. This is a turn-based game. On your turn, you will be taking your little cube of your color, and you will be moving it, if it's on the refresh location, to the blank space just below the actions, and your actions are to move, to play, and to gather. If it's on the square below them, you will take all three. On every turn after you have placed it on the square, you're gonna be moving it up and placing it on one of these main three actions, whether it be move, play, or gather. And when you do so, let's say you place it on move, you will have the play and gather actions open and visible. Those are the actions that you can take on your turn. So your first turn you'll get three actions, and every turn after that you will get two. 
unless you ever refresh, in which case you'll go back to the refresh and on your next turn, you'll get to take three. Now, on your turn, like I said, you can move and then go ahead and take the actions. If you don't want to do that, instead you can refresh. So for instance, let's say you need to do all three actions on your next turn and you can't do that, you can only do two of them. You can instead choose to pass, refresh, and then on your next turn you can take all three. Refreshing will also take any of your characters and cards on your right hand side of your board and move them back to your left hand side. For easy ease of like understanding how to play, everything on your left hand side is basically your hand and everything on your right hand side of your game board is stuff that is in play. And that's the basic idea. And you're gonna be going around taking your action or actions and then eventually somebody's gonna complete four objectives and that will trigger the last turn of the game for everybody, in which case you'll score. Let's talk about the actions now. Action one is to move. When you move, you're going to start off at the very bottom space of the game board and you can move up to th up to three spaces. You may move through players, but you may not stop on player spaces. There may be cards that change that rule. And when you do so, you can choose any of the bottom locations. You can go one, two, and three, and you'll stop somewhere. And that's all it is for movement. It's very simple. In fact, just like how Scythe is kind of simple with the actions, this is as well. Moving is moving three spaces. Playing is taking any card from your left area and putting it onto your right area. When you do that, you're gonna gain the base bonus, which is on the top left-hand corner of the, of the card. Some of them will give you additional bonuses, provided that you meet certain requirements. Like for instance, this one says you have to have a number of achievements completed in order to gain extra bonuses. So you can gain one guile. If you have a star bonus, one star, you can go ahead and gain the power. And then if you have two, you can gain another guile. So just taking this and playing it is gonna give you that bonus. Additionally, when you play a card, if you have the character of that specific color from the bottom of the card, you can place it from your game board onto that card and take the bonus action. These actions involve a variety of different things you can do, but they're all kind of like their own unique actions and that all have their own like keywords. Some of them are going to let you complete a quest or defeat corruption or meld meteorites onto your board or craft items. But regardless, that's the basic idea. Take a card, place it over, gain the base bonus, and if you, if you have the worker of the color on your game board, you can move it onto the card and take the bonus action. The last thing that you can do is you can gather. Uh, gathering is actually quite simple as well. When you move a character on a space, or if you're already currently there, you can gather the space's bonus. A space's bonus is either gonna have one or two things that you have the option to do, or a combination of actions that you can take. Each of them are very unique. One of them will let you take a card from this middle area here and place it on the right hand side, not able to use it until you refresh. Another one might be to take one of the different colored workers or to draw cards from the deck and place one of them into your hand, as well as to take actions of adjacent spaces. You can refresh or rescue one character from the right hand side of your game board and put it on your left and so on and so forth. There starts to open up new ones like being able to meld and being able to place stars on your achievements provided that you've made the goal. And uh, some of them will even give you straight up victory points. And that's the basis of the game. It's actually that simple. You can move, you can go ahead and take the action of the space that you're on, and if you have that other last option, you can also play a card along with a worker on that card. Just remember your last thing you can do is if you don't wanna do anything, you can refresh. And when you refresh, you'll take all the cards as well as your workers and bring them back to your left-hand side game board as well as all the workers onto your main game board. If you're able to complete the different quests, you'll be taking those stars as long as you have the ability to do so from one of the actions on the game board or from your cards and place them on this board here. And there's a variety of achievements. Achievement one is to complete up to four quests. You have to complete exactly four quests. Another one is you can meld four of the meteorites. Another is going to be to have four items equipped to defeat the dreaded boss, the Corruption 20 marker. Uh, you can also uh, have seven corruption markers. You can have eight cards in your play area or hand. And you can also either have seven workers or have five map tokens. Well, let's discuss a little bit of that now. So when you move on to a space that has not been flipped over, you're going to stop there when you do and flip it over. So you can go, okay, I wanna move three spaces, one, two, three, I can stop that space. And you'll take the map token on there if there is one. You'll flip the space over place your guy, your character back there, 
and place your map token on your game board. And then you're going to go ahead and dig into the bag. Now, each of the bottom right hand sides will have this kind of blue border around it and it'll tell you a number. In this case, it says five plus. And you'll draw these corruption markers from the bag until you reach that number. So if this, in this case, five plus, I drew a five green, I place it on there, I'm good. I hit at least five. If I were to pull out a two, I have to pull again. And if I pulled out a five, that would be seven, which is still higher than five, so it would stop. So you might have one, maybe two, or even three different corruption markers on each of these spaces here. In order to defeat these, you'll have to have a vanquish action, which is how you play a card from your left-hand side over to your right. That card says that you can vanquish as long as you played a worker on it. And then you can remove these by spending your points. Now, remember, whenever you play a card, you're gonna have base bonuses on the top left, which will give you either guile or power, and you'll be tracking them on your game board here. And that's how you're going to be defeating corruption, is if you need five guile to defeat, like, for instance, this little corruption marker, and you have five, you could take one of those cards and vanquish by spending five guile and removing this from the game. And that's how you achieve those. You open these guys up and now it's another action you or somebody else can take later. And most of the time when you go ahead and do a vanquish action, if you defeat the last corruption marker, you'll get to take the bonus action on the board here. Each of the boards as you move farther north, north we're gonna be, are gonna be more, like, more challenging as far as corruption, but also give you better actions. Like for instance, up here, this ice cave will let you get a purple worker, will give you a victory point, and it's also gonna let you uh, craft an item. Um, we can go over a few of these different things. If you want to craft an item, you have to have an item somewhere, whether it be in your hand or an active area, and you will place it on the right-hand side game board, sliding it in. Thusly, its passive will count forever, but you can never put a work on it. You ignore the worker ability, you ignore the base ability, and you just get the passive. You can have up to four of them. Uh, to meld, you just have to have an artifact, and the artifacts will allow you to, if you pay the meld ability, also gain a unique benefit when you place it, like gaining $1 per uh, worker that's been placed. And you'll place them on the bottom of your board. And the last one is questing. Uh, there are quests on the board, and on the right-hand side, it will tell you what location you have to be at to complete it, S6. It will tell you what, how much willpower or guile, or power or guile you will need in order to do so. In this case, it's just one power. And what bonus you get. And if you are there, have the ability to complete the quest and pay the cost, you'll slide it in the top portion of your game board and it will count as one quest complete at the end of the game. Why do you care about quests and items and all that? Well, frankly, because yes, they're all objectives. They're all ch uh, ways to end the game. But additionally, at the end of the game, you're gonna score victory points based on A, your coins, which represent your currency, which also represent your uh, victory points. You'll also score based on the number of quests you completed. If you have zero quests, you'll get five points for every star you place. And then all the way up to three quests or more will give you 10 points per star. You will score points based on the items that you have crafted in the bottom right hand corner. And you will score two points for each corruption that you have vanquished off of the game board. And that's the basic idea of the game. At the end of the game, you'll track all that stuff to see whoever has the most victory points based on those four important aspects of the game. And whoever has the most is the winner of the game, Expeditions. What do I think about it? Expeditions is Scythe Light. It is kind of a lighter variant of that type of game. It's very, very different. This is all card driven. Um, but the way in which you're taking actions, being able to refresh and kind of go, okay, now I can take these three and then moving that onto the, your, your, your board there, now I'm only taking two of them. So having to make those choices like, okay, I've taken my three, my next turn I now want to move but I also have to decide if I'm either gonna play or gather because I can't do both if I want to move. Okay, so I will gather. So I took it on, placed it on play, now I can move and also gather, taking the action of whatever space I end up on. And so you're kind of making these little crunchy choices as you move throughout the game. And at some points in time, you're gonna actually wanna take all three. And there are ways which you can refresh that don't just involve basically losing your turn and refreshing. Sometimes there's a card you can play or a space on the game board that will allow you to refresh and also perhaps even sweep, which removes all these face-up cards on the board here. Um, and you're 
basically attempting to try and make the best play plays possible. You're trying to kind of create an, uh, uh, a path to complete each of the objectives you want to complete. You only need to complete four, so you don't need to go in all the different ways. You have to kind of select the four main outcomes you wish to achieve. Quests are extremely important because they give you huge victory points for stars that you place, and you're already going to want to place stars on the game board here because that's how the game ends, and that's the majority of how you can gain victory points. But you are working on all different types of things, whereas the quests are going to be quite simple and not super cost effective. You're basically going to be losing cards from your play area because every card in the game not only might be a meteorite or a quest or an item, but also provides you with an ability and a core stat, which is going to give you like generated uh, guile and or power. So these are useful cards up until you get rid of them. And you have to kind of decide when that's best to do. So quests are those things that you can move to the location and dump them and guarantee a stronger point value at the end of the game. But if you do them too early, you're kind of slowing yourself down in being able to use the ability that the card provides. Then we have things like meteorites. Meteorites are things that as you place them down on your game board in the bottom area, up to four of them, they, they kind of give you a passive instant, well not passive, like an instant bonus based on how everything's set out. Do you have yellow workers or do you have a certain number of cards played out? And if so, you'll gain victory points when you do that. And it's also a way, of course, of getting achievements. So the next thing is items. Items, you can play them and gain their core value and you can place a worker on them to gain their passive value. And it'll stay useful as long as it's on your right-hand side of the field. But when you refresh, those cards go back. And in order to get that passive benefit back and last a while, you have to go ahead and replay it. If you craft that item, the passive will stay forever. You never have to refresh and worry about any meteorites, quests, or items that you've made. They will stay there forever and any of their benefits or bonuses they give you will be translated up until the end of the game. And so those type of things have, are like weighed decisions. You have these cards and you want to utilize their abilities, but when you start melding or crafting or completing quests, they go away. And at each of the different cards you get from the open area or from the deck is going to require actions, whether you have to move and, and then of course take the action, the gather action to gain new cards on the top of the deck or here and place them down, or whether you have to actually do a special ability, which has to take a card from the middle here and actually place it on your right-hand side game board and gain no benefit until you refresh. It's going to be tight decision-making things you have to do. Sometimes your turn's gonna be wild and wonderful, and other times it's just gonna be strategic to move to the next step in order to get that point in time where you can do something really unique. So while some turns might be lackluster, you kind of have to have to expect like, okay, it's gonna take me three turns to do the thing that I want to do. And on that third turn, that's when the big payoff hits. Additionally too, sometimes you're going to lose out on the payoff. Sometimes you're traveling to an area to gain currency, to then move to an area to complete a quest. And if that area is blocked by another player, you have say sustained substantial damage in the fact that you lose an action and or a turn in order to wait for that space to be opened up. And so there are ways in which players will not be battling you in this game, like in Scythe, they will be preventing you from doing what you want to do. Maybe you need a quest of a certain type, and so a player gathers that quest and stops you from being able to complete that specific achievement. There are ways to, there are ways to sabotage your opponent without actually having to fight them. And so there is this light, like interesting combat, like area control type thing going on in this game without it being spoken. People know what other people are going to need in order to get that last star, and if they're behind, they can kind of slow other players down, which can be a positive and a negative thing in the game. It can be very frustrating for a player to like set up this amazing plan, and then they've done everything they need to do, and then the, the player after them goes, ah, I see what they're doing. I'm gonna move here and completely thwart them. And I could stay on that space for a bit of time too, to extra thwart them, to make them kind of set up a new plan. So you always wanna have multiple strategies going into expeditions. You don't wanna kind of make it too simple and too obvious as to what you're doing if you're playing with some ruthless players. If everybody's just playing and having fun, you're going to have players that are going to walk onto spaces and block people off or take cards that people need, but it's going to be lighter. So it's really based on your play group as to how much the aggressiveness is going to be sitting in this one here specifically. Some of the cool things about this game too are the ability to kind of combat the corruption on the locations. You're basically like gaining the required resources 
and then playing the cards, spending them, and then taking those tokens off, opening up portions of the game board. You open it up for the other players, but in return, you get a benefit of not only being able to eventually place an achievement or objective uh, token, but also you get victory points for corruption at the end of the game at two apiece. So the game kind of opens up by all players because they kind of have to do that and it supports other players who are behind not having to worry about that because these spaces get more and more powerful as you unlock them, as you open them up, and as you defeat the corruption around them. Another really cool thing about this game is how card driven it is. Each of the characters you start with are going to provide you with some base I call them like, kind of like in Magic the Gathering, how you have like flying and trample and whatnot. They're like a keywords. In this case here, Matthew for me lets me solve quests. That's a key one. That's a very important one. There are a few of them. There's like melding, solving quests, boasting, which is placing stars down, uh, being able to craft or and that, and that kind of thing. And, and all of the things you can do on your turn are referenced on this little uh, player <laughs> reference sheet here. So the main ones will be on here somewhere. Ah, here they are. Solve, upgrade, meld, boast, and vanquish. Solving lets you complete quests, which you're going to hopefully have on one of these guys here. Upgrading is for items, melding is for meteorites, boasting is for placing your glory tokens, your achievement tokens on the board there, and vanquishing is removing the corruption on the spaces by spending your currency. And there's also a few other ones like Move, Play, Gather, and Refresh. Most of them involve the main actions of the game, but you'll find them on these cards here, kind of giving you little combos. And these cards represent kind of actions in and of themselves that kind of change the action of play. Play is just simply playing an action that you have, provided you have the worker for it. So there's the startup and it starts and builds, it's kind of slow, and then all of a sudden it starts to get going and it ramps up. And the game kind of comes like to a point where everybody knows, okay, the game's getting really close here. And I love that aspect of the game. It, it's a very refreshing, unique little thing I haven't seen done very well, very, very much. Eh, I don't know, maybe, maybe not even very well. I haven't actually seen a whole lot of these type of games that do that. And it has that whole Stonemeyer feel to it, but, but it being a completely separate game from Scythe. It does share a lot of the theme and style, characters, art, but the game itself is nothing to do with Scythe in terms of gameplay. It's just got little elements, and if you've played Scythe before, you'll notice some of these elements. Just like noticing that you play when most Stonemaier games, like they all have their own kind of like Jamie's like pinch of salt thrown on all of them, and you can kind of feel that in this game and all of the other ones as well. Speaking of that, talk about quality. It's excellent quality. Miniatures are excellent. excellent. Everything you'd expect from a Stonemaier game is here. High quality miniatures, boards, cards, wooden meeples, custom markers, and the old basics, the old, the old like, style of the stars and whatnot that you use in most of all of his games. And the art is simply wonderful. It's great. Really, really well done. High production. Board looks great when you start the game off. It's very presentable. And it gets people wanting to play it and try it out. And it's simple enough to teach rather quickly and even if you don't know all the actions in the game, all you have to do is teach the first basic three, and then reading the cards tells you how to play the cards. And I love that about this game. I love that about a lot of Stonemaier games where it's just so elegant. Everything is simple in what you can do on your turn, but it is complex and crunchy when it comes to which ones you want to do based on those three. Playing a card is simple. Take a card and play it. That's it, that's all it is. If you have 10 cards though, that's 10 different things you can do, which can influence 50 different things on the game board or with other players. And that is a really cool aspect to it, building your own kind of game and experiencing it for yourself and kind of adding the little touches that you want to add based on the cards that you end up getting in the game. Exhibitions is a great game. This is a game I'm keeping for sure. It's going to go right in my Stonemaier collection so that I can play it again. Um, if you like these type of games, if you like Stonemaier games, this is another solid choice. If you like Scythe, this is going to be a little different, mainly card driven, but it still has that elegance to it and it's unique and interesting. I, I like it. I really like this game. I, I can't foresee a whole lot of negatives other than that it can be frustrating at times when players go on your locations and it can be frustrating maybe not getting the cards that you want or people sweeping the board from just when you need that thing and you lose out on it. So that can be a little heartbreaking, but that's part of this game. And so if that's just not your thing, this game will not be your thing either. But as far as everything else goes, tight, crunchy, quick. You know when the game is gonna end, you have this kind of like internal timer that's going on. It's a wonderful game. Take, take, take a look at Expeditions.
Thank you guys for watching another Unfiltered Gamer board game review for the game Expeditions. 1920 plus. I don't know how that works. It's 1920 plus Expeditions. Is that like after the 1920s? Probably something to do with the scythe storyline. Some some scythe buff here probably understand what that is. But uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a really cool game. There's a link down below the description where you can go ahead and pick up this game. It's currently available on the Stonemaier website and probably also Amazon. If there is, there'll be an affiliate link as well. It's a disclaimer. Uh, you can also check out our website on filtergamer.com, blog posts, giveaways, Kickstarter, lists, and more. We do a bunch of stuff on there and new reviews and stuff like that pop on our Instagram from Brian uh, from time to time. You can also subscribe if you think we do an excellent, wonderful, unique job at explaining these games. Perhaps you could push that button and the notification bell button so you can see more of our videos at a later date. All right, guys, that's all I got for you this time. And as always, I look forward to going on adventures, or should I say expeditions, with you next time.